Among the settlers who emigrated from Great Britain to North America in the early colonial period, there were three dominant motivations. All of the colonists had them all to some degree or another, but in almost all of them, one predominated in their minds. And that was desperation, greed, and fanaticism. And the fanatics were concentrated on the stony, rocky lands of New England, not in the lush, uh, agriculturally rich region uh, of Jamestown, which was far too valuable to be left to a bunch of religious fanatics and had to be operated as a going profit-seeking concern very early. Uh, The New England settlements were peopled by real believers, people who were adjusting to the rapid change of life that the early modern era had imposed on uh, European subjects by uh, enlivening their religion with a deep fire of personal um, revelation. This is, this is the, the Puritan strain of Calvinism that explodes in Northern Europe as capitalism emerges. As capitalism destroys the old uh, feudal religious bonds that kept people together uh, and that also forestalled a full domination of capital were being destroyed uh, by the competition of the, of the European states. Uh, and, and capitalism was wrenching people from their landed understanding of religious uh, experience and personalizing it. Uh, and this personalization of religious experience became known as Protestantism, and it became the social logic of capitalism because it had an explanation. It had a praxis, a praxis that takes as its basis the notion that human interaction will no longer be dominated by the will of God. That is to say, our, our natural, our felt natural relationships with other people and other things because the market in its intrusion has now turned us all into strangers in a way that we hadn't ever been before. And that means that the social reinforcement of religious belief are min- minimized. They, they, are, they are dissolved, uh, and we are left more and more alone uh, in, in, in more isolated social circumstances in a competitive relationship with uh, our neighbor, our Christian neighbor. And the, the neurotic Calvinism that eru- erupts in England in the early 17th century uh, is a response to this condition from people who have forfeited the social tie but still need some way to reinscribe their belief, some way to live their feeling of communion, of godly connection, of of, uh, connection to a transcendent notion that is defined by uh, the world and the people around us. And that world required a God that resided not at the hearth and not in public, a public that was now increasingly a market, it resided in the heart. It resided in the self, inscribed as defined against the whole, against uh, the social. And a God, therefore, who becomes unknowable and inscrutable and terrifying. And that is what Calvinism uh, imposes, this notion of God as someone who cannot be anti- something that cannot be anticipated and therefore something that must be feared. Because Calvin took his rationalist mind to the question of religion in a non asocial context and realized that there could be no confirmation of who's going to heaven or who's going to hell by the world that they live in, because that is a world uh, of chance and misery. And the experience of life on earth is determined by these, these naturalized market forces that have intruded and replaced the social bonds of feudalism. If you failed in the market, you were on your own for the first time in a real sense. You were, uh, there was no social expectation of uh, cooperation with the struggling. Uh, there becomes a struggle of all against all. Hobbes is born really in the market, not in history and reality. It's born at this moment, this understanding of what it is to be a human in this desperate struggle for resources in an increasingly technological world. So in this world, God is no longer something that can be, whose will can be divined by the world. The world is now tainted, fallen in a real sense. We, we have only to fear and tremble before God and essentially act as though 
we feel a connection to him as though, as though he were in our lives because it is finally and totally out of our abilities to move towards God. It is up to God. And that means that there is predestination of souls and there is no way of knowing if you're saved or not, except by spending your life acting like you are, which creates this terrifying internal panopticon that uh, drives eventually this class of people as they come to the United States and form their social order and become the most uh, adept merchants in the new uh, capitalism of the new world and become more and more neurotic. But in the initial wave of immigration, those, those early Puritans were escaping a new order in, in England that they could not withstand morally in that they could not stand to feel their connection uh, to the world, to each other, to be severed so easily because it was too much to ask for such people to feel separate from God for so long. And so they did the one thing that they could do. They tried to seek on what they thought of as a virgin and unspoiled territory where pre-existing social relationships didn't exist, that people of good faith, a real belief, could come together and live together cooperated, created a community of, of believers who could make a world where God's will could be known, where we could see God in the world because we are making it. Yes, we're using the market. Yes, we're using this new asocial religious conception, but we are using it together to remake a religion that is rooted and grounded in the land as well and in our social relationships as well as in our hearts. This is an attempt to uh, wrest Protestantism basically away from the imperatives of the market to re-socialize Protestantism. It can only do that absent the existing, dominating, st totally uh, socially oppressive matrix of late feudal uh, European aristocracy. At this point, uh, the, the crowned heads of Europe are a debauched, licentious bunch they have no, not a spark of godliness among any of them. They've lived too comfortably too long. They, they have made heaven on earth uh, in, the, in the castles and in the courts. And as such, uh, don't really have to think too much about what happens after or what they're giving up by hoarding all of that uh, pleasure because it's not precarious as it is for a downwardly mobile merchant in uh, uh, early modern England or a, a frantic amateur farmer trying to stay alive uh, in Massachusetts by digging some goddamn green out of the rocky soil of New England. And of course, they were also desperate because many of them were downward immobile, and they were, of course, greedy because they imagined that their, that God's will in the world would be their pleasure, their enjoyment of the world with each other. So, of course, they would be able to make a comfortable life for themselves here by expropriating from people who did not count in their moral calculus, who were too abstracted from their social experience to resonate uh, as a full human. And they tried to make it work. The early New England colonies are essentially religious communes. I mean, they are, they're sort of Jonestowns. But because of the, uh, the fortuitous mass uh, death of uh, Native Americans in this region, who had been absolutely cut down by smallpox infection, courtesy of early American, uh, like pre-English uh, contact between uh, native uh, uh, peoples and and European fishermen uh, meant that there was a lot of land that was just not uh, could not even be contested by the local native populations. And then those who did survive kind of needed the uh, after a while needed the settlers as much as the settlers needed them, uh, or at least so they felt that to be the case, or else they obviously could have killed them all. Um, but they build this this little these little uh, theocratic statelets. And, of course, they split over doctrine, and Roger Williams and Ann Hutchison have to go to Rhode Island because, oh, what is this? Oh, no, if we leave it up to ourselves and we're in the market, over time we are going to end up creating a very idiosyncratic religious convictions because they are not being uh, reaffirmed socially because I am not spending my time immersed in a religious sociality. I am spending it working. I am spending it trading, and I am spending it thinking about my soul as an isolated monad, not as a part of a greater spiritual tapestry, which is 
that is the consolation of religion. That's the actual thing that makes religious belief spiritually soothing. It's the itch that everything's trying to scratch in modernity and can't quite make it. And that is that we give it the name of God, but God is just our, the accumulation of our positive relationship, our a positive emotional connection to the experience of life, to the sens- the sensual engagement of our bodies with other people in the world. So they sp- start splitting up, start burning witches, of course, because it's not a stable conviction because it is not socially reaffirmed. In fact, there is a social competition. The more godly appearing are going to more likely be the saved, right? The more successful materially and the more uh, publicly pious will likely be the saved, right? If we think about it logically as God making a decision to save people, well, who's he going to save? It's getting ahead of God's um, thought process, basically. And that's a drive towards success, and that is a competitive drive away from each other. As they're trying to pull together, they're also being pushed apart by the competitive nature here, the competitive framework of being the most successful farmer, the one with the most land, the one with the most ease and comfort, the one who is able to devote the most of his life to the rituals and trappings of religious conviction are going to be the saved. And so the the hearts of these religious communities are eventually just destroyed uh, and capital eventually comes for uh, and over and consumes and overcomes all these social forms, swallows them and digests them and creates the, the engine of North American capitalism, which is in the, uh, the merchant trading communities. And then later industrial hubs of uh, new England. Uh, it is Boston as a trading capital before and during the American revolution. Uh, and then the areas around Boston as the first, industrial um, the factory infrastructure in the United States, the uh, mills staffed mostly by young girls, something that you don't, wouldn't think that uh, Puritans uh, uh, fixated on building God city in the wilderness would really accept, would think that was part of a fucking godly world where, where young girls are forced to go into a room together and risk getting their arms ripped off by fucking machines. But it is necessary the competitive framework is 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 now uh, lost its religious patina. Now all of by even the early republic, the descendants of the Puritans now barely believe in God at all as a real thing. Have totally of almost totally materialized their uh, religious beliefs. John Adams isn't a Calvinist; he is a Unitarian. His son is basically uh, a agnostic and. Their descendants now are all of some or another strict secular humanist creed derived from the 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 uh, the, the social the echoes of the social gospel of the original project of the city on the hill, like the social infrastructure necessary to have a godly uh, social order. Now we have that at the end of history in the form of the the secular creed of of social liberalism. But that's all that's left because capitalism has hollowed out the rest. And while in the counting houses of Boston, people are just quietly and contentedly turning into secular humanists. Out in the fields, the people struggling to rend the living out of the, the, the rocky earth of New England, those who are uh, having to sell their labor for wages in the cities and be away from their families in order to stay alive, those who are doing the monstrous work of extracting surplus value from uh, slave labor or someone living in a pioneer cabin and in a life or death mortal battle with local native uh, tribes whose land you're they're stealing in those environs, the uh, pull away from a grounded religious tradition is much more traumatic because it's not accompanied by total physical comfort and ease, which it is at the heart of capitalism. Around the edges, there's an accumulated misery that is piling up that is increasingly being ascribed to the social order around people. People begin to feel that they are not living a life that can be conceived as, of as, can be conceived of as Christian because they have been pulled by the compulsions of the market uh, out of 
harmony really with with the world around them and they feel that and they want to they want to resist it and so you see throughout early american colonial and then early american republican history a cycle of explosions of religious fervor that accompany uh, certain new stages of American uh, colonial development and settler de- settlement development uh, and, the, and, and in capital intensification. And so one of the biggest bursts of these occurs in upstate New York. So upstate New York had been land that had been relatively recently settled by mostly settlers from New England who had essentially crapped out of social uh, life Uh, Either from some combination of, and because of some combination of, as we said, greed, fanaticism, uh, and desperation moved around some of the, and a lot of them ended up in Northern and uh, Western New York because that land had been granted after the revolutionary war uh, had been, that land had been deeded to revolutionary war veterans as payment for their service during the war. Uh, And a lot of it had been sold buy those very veterans for cash in the economic crunch that happened after the revolution during the articles of confederation years. So a lot of that land was being sold on the open market and was being bought by people looking to find some stability, some social stability. And one of the things drawing the other thing drawing them there was the first and biggest public infrastructure project of the uh, young America, the Erie canal. I had a mule, his name was Sal, went 15 miles on the Erie Canal. It was originally funded by, it was, it was, it was the brainchild of, uh, of New York political dynast, Governor uh, DeWitt Clinton, who, uh, in the face of the Jeffersonian uh, hostility to, to publicly funded works, which was epidemic at the time, Clinton pushed, as governor of New York, heavily for a, uh, a public-funded canal connecting uh, uh, Lake Erie to New York City uh, and with the idea that it would stimulate economic growth. Now, this threw in the flate. This is something that a lot of people in America thought was unconstitutional, but was also necessary for America's economic, for the American economy to grow. And so even though a lot of the public sentiment was against it, uh, the local demand for something there and also the power of the economy of New York Harbor at that point to of the, of the New York uh, merchant class at that point who desired to see this for their own benefit, they would be able to do more. They would be able to do more trading. They would be able to make more money. And so they formed a powerful interest group pushing for the Erie Canal. And it was begun in 1917 and it, it took until uh, 1821 to finish. So from 1817, you see this huge burst of economic activity as the Erie Canal is being built as a, as, as a uh, labor swarm, from across the country and uh, from Europe to work building this canal. And then after the canal is done, this new efflorescence of uh, urban culture in these uh, ports along the canal within like the, within New York itself, sort of going down through New York. And it's this canal that brings capitalism in its advanced industrial form uh, to the, the people who had fled the farthest from making an accommodation with capitalism spiritually, the people who were demanding something more out of life than submitting uh, to this inhuman regime who wanted to still feel God in their lives. And into their midst came this massive explosion of a uh, capitalist trade uh, and uh, infrastructure development. Uh, and it creates uh, the Whig Party, in part uh, from the, the political machine that comes up around Millard Fillmore in, uh, in Buffalo and the weed machine around uh, William Seward, all, all that energy uh, is unleashed by the Erie Canal, but so is a powerful amount of psychic discomfort and fear. Uh, this, this, there's, the, the, the hoofbeats are coming to people who have uh, been spending their entire lives trying to stay in some sort of harmony with a God that they could hear in their minds. And we're now having their ability to do so torn away from them. Uh, and there's a bit from Moby Dick in the chapter, the whole town story describing a guy from the Erie canal region that I think best exemplifies exactly what the social implications of the Erie canals construction through upstate New York were. 
So this is a guy uh, describing uh, the canal area. For 360 miles, gentlemen, through the entire breadth of the state of New York, through numerous populous cities and most thriving villages, through long, dismal, uninhabited swamps and affluent, cultivated fields, unrivaled for fertility, by billiard room and bar room, through the holy of holies of great forests, on Roman arches over Indian rivers, through sun and shade, by happy hearts or broken, through all the wide, contrasting scenes of those noble Mohawk counties, and especially by rows of snow-white chapels whose spires stand almost like milestones, flows one continual stream of Venetianly corrupt and often lawless life. There's your true Ashanti, gentlemen. There howl your pagans. Where you ever find them, next door to you, under the long-flung shadow and the snug patronizing lee of churches. For by some curious fatality, as it is often noted of your metropolitan freebooters that they ever encamp around the halls of justice. So sinners, gentlemen, most abound in holiest vicinities. And then a little later. In some gentlemen, what the wildness of this canal life is, is emphatically evinced by this, that our wild whale fishery contains so many of its most finished graduates and that scarce of any race of mankind, except Sydney men, are so much distrusted by our whaling captains. Nor does it at all diminish the curiousness of this matter that to many thousands of our rural boys and young men born along its line, the probationary life of the Grand Canal furnishes the sole transition between quietly reaping in a Christian cornfield and recklessly plowing the waters of the most barbaric seas. I think it gives you kind of a sense of the combustible social situation that existed here in this area. And so over the next uh, 20 years or so, from, from the creation of the Erie Canal into the 1830s, you see this huge explosion of religious fervor in the counties of northern New York. It becomes known as the burned over district, as in every part of it has already had a massive wave of evangelical passion seize the uh, local uh, population and burn through so that all of the, by, at a certain point, all of the energy had become extinguished. And what extinguished it was participation by many of the people of this region in a new explosion of millenniary prophetic religious movements that emerge around charismatic figures who claim a personal prophetic relationship to their Christian souls and that gathered people around them in new understandings of religious life. And the thing they all had in common was is that they attempted to break people away from the relative isolation of rural life and the alienation of urban life that saw people spend very little time in churches. Many of these people uh, were devoutly religious, read their Bibles uh, fanatically, but had little to no uh, interaction with formal church worship. Uh, and, and after a while, this, in a, in a situation of constant precarity and, and marketization of life, uh, leads to a, a explosive demand, a, a spiritual cry for some sort of new understanding of religious life. And that meant coming together uh, into a community of faith that is meets together more regularly, whose uh, religious uh, worship is more passionate, is more emotionally invested, provides more of a cathartic relationship to, to the alienations of life uh, than was allowed for uh, in the more sterile environs of conventional Protestantism. And so in, during this period, you see the explosion of uh, the Millerites, a, a sect around a farmer named William Miller who uh, got his notebook out, went to his Bible, and figured out uh, mathematically that the world was going to end in four years. I believe it was four. It might have been less. And gathered around him a huge community of believers who went to the top of a hill on the appointed day and waited for the world to end, and when it didn't, had to walk back down, many of them having sold all of their possessions. And they, they uh, and amazingly, though, that was not the end of uh, the movement. Uh, it eventually morphed into the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, and to this day, they refer to this moment as the Great Disappointment. And uh, the Branch Davidians, by the way, of Waco, were a offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists. So you see how this prophetic tradition uh, ex explodes through America as people try to stabilize their relationship with religion in an increasingly godless world, an increasingly marketized 
world. But at the same time, the Jehovah's Witnesses are emerging, which is a very scholastic approach to biblical literalis- liter- literalism uh, and that comes up with essentially a, a new textural read on the Bible. It's essentially literary criticism. Jehovah's Witnesses is, is literary criticism of the Bible. It says, you guys have been interpreting this wrong the whole time. This is what it actually means. And, and, and they get a lot of people in this increasingly uh, intellectualized age, this increasingly uh, empirically minded age, that gets a lot of supporters too. This is also the beginning of a lot of the spiritualism that will emerge more in the late 1900s among the uh, uh, anxious middle class when you have rapping seances from the Fox sisters in Hydesville, New York. Uh, and you've got the shakers coming together into religious communities of purity, which die out because they don't have sex with each other. But then you have uh, more secular uh, utopian movements like the Oneida Society, uh, who are uh, inspired by the utopian socialist Robert Owen and the French utopian socialist Charles Fourier into building a equitable, uh, free uh, social order that is not captured by the market. And there's there's more than this, even than uh, Jemima Wilkinson and uh, Anne Lee, John Humphrey Noyes, and they all get their supporters, they all gain their adherence of people who are looking for some new way to, to, to feel God in their life every day in America. And a lot of them are being pulled, as you're seeing, towards community, towards trying to pool resources, which is possible in this frontier land where the assumption will always be that the native population will be dispossessed and their land will be taken. And in that context, many people come together with a new take, basically, on Christianity that facilitates the perpetuation of religious community. And the most successful of these movements, in the, in, in the sense that it did the most to shield those who participated in it from having to be stripped of their religious belief, be stripped of their uh, understanding and sense of God in the world, uh, are the Mormons. One of the families that moves uh, uh, to upstate New York in this time, pursuing uh, uh, elusive uh, security is the Smith family of Vermont. Uh, Joseph Smith Sr. and uh, Lily Smith uh, are the descendants of those Puritans, uh, and they uh, find themselves making a precarious living in that that notoriously fickle New England uh, topsoil. And eventually, uh, after being uh, defrauded by a business partner uh, and, and forced to sell a farm in Vermont, uh, Joseph Smith leads his family on a journey across New England. He ping-pongs from uh, New Hampshire to Massachusetts to Connecticut, eventually comes back to Vermont. And it's in Vermont in 1805 when they give birth, uh, where Lily gives birth to uh, Joseph Smith Jr., what, uh, one of their 11 children. But eventually, uh, the entire Smith family moves to Palmyra, New York, in this region. Uh, and uh, this whole time, both of the Smith parents are having deep religious uh, journeys. Lily is a devout, for her whole life, is a devout Congregationalist, which is the descent, which is the evolved form of the early Puritan church in New England. But his father was never able to find any real comfort in any of the formal denominations. Uh, he bounced around from churches and he mostly prayed silent, privately. Uh, and he also was, he would claim that he had religious visions. And so in Palmyra, young Joseph Smith, who in his teen years, or as a young man, was uh, stricken down by a bone infection, uh, which caused him to have to spend three years on crutches. So young Joseph, the, this, this kid who had to sort of nurse himself back to health, by his early teens is already evincing uh, certain sensitivities to the world around him. He is a scryer in that he he uh, claims that he can look through uh, glass to to find buried treasure in the in the in the woods, which is part of a, a tradition of of American like, European settler folk magic, which uh, until you have totally you know ripped people away from the land uh, is going to exist within any uh, religious tradition, uh, and that definitely survived. Uh, into this point anyway, within Christianity, although it's, it's days are numbered. Uh, he also was a uh, water dowser who claimed that he could find water uh, by using a stick to draw him to it. Uh, and by the time he was 15, uh, he was having uh, ecstatic religious visions that he described in detail to his parents and to 
family friends and to uh, relations. Uh, and these these visions were so powerful, and the way that he described them was so uh, convin- uh, evocative. And the language he used felt so sort of ethereal and godly that people were very, very credulous. In 1832, he, he would describe his he would describe his first youthful vision as a pillar of light above the brightness of the moon at noonday came down from above and rested upon me. And I was filled with the spirit of God. And the Lord spake to me saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. So thy may walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. And one of the visions he got from this uh, voice that he later uh, identified with the angel Moroni were directions to uh, hidden golden plates that were, buried in the woods. Uh, and eventually Smith produced two people around him, these, these golden plates with the writing on them that appeared to be hieroglyphics and that Smith called new Egyptian. Now, while uh, eventually Smith is Smith gains uh, a, 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 a small following of, of, of devoted early believers, including a man named uh, Sidney, Sidney Bridgeton. Uh, who has who shares some visions with with Smith, uh, and who with Smith helps translate these plates using uh, first uh, a number of stones placed in a hat that that he looked uh, into, uh, and also uh, a pair of spec sort of spectacle things that he claimed came uh, with the plates. And there's a number of temp- of attempts over uh, the months to translate. Uh, these plates uh, and some document. Uh, there's some is, some parts of it are written. They're destroyed. They have to start over again. Uh, what ends up coming out of this process is this thing that becomes known as the Book of Mormon, which is a description of it is as it is. They later call it uh, a another testament of Jesus Christ, uh, and this is uh, it is essentially a pseudo biblical description of a the eternal battle between two tribes in. Uh, in ancient America, the Nephites and the Lamanites, uh, one uh, pious and one uh, profane. Uh, and it describes the ups and downs, the battles between these two tribes, uh, and essentially the, the, the decadent cycle of empire. Uh, it is a reminder that earthly institutions will collapse and that life absent a godly uh, uh, prerogative uh, is, flicker, is, is fleeting, uh, and doomed to failure, that all human projects uh, are dust. And so therefore, the only redemption to this can come uh, from Christ. And Christ does come after his death, according to the Book of Mormon, to reveal himself to these Americans, these early Americans, the Nephites. And this is essentially a attempt to rebrand Christianity, which has all of its most evocative associations uh, uh, with other places, with, with the Middle East, uh, and which is removed really in its, in its narrative from like the here and now of American life. Mormonism uh, gave the American land that people uh, were trotting on an enchantment that it previously hadn't had. It was land trod upon by Jesus. The, the American uh, people were, were now, were not just the, the, uh, Castoffs of a European Christianity or a Mideastern Christianity. They were the, the heralds of a new American Christianity. Uh, and it, even though this flew in the face, obviously, of a lot of Protestant orthodoxy, uh, Smith, thanks to his charismatic manner, the fact that the books themselves are compelling, especially when you consider that it is well established that they were written, quote unquote, by Joseph Smith with his head down slowly saying sentences and on the other side of a curtain, one of his transcribers writing down what he was saying. It was not anything that he had written. He wrote uh, by himself or, or plagiarized from another source. It all came from his head. Uh, and so whatever degree of, uh, of fraud he thought he knew he was perpetrating and whatever degree of real truth that he thought the fraud was worth doing to convey uh, all of it was enough to keep him uh, very impressively focused on trying to convince people of this. And he had a very good luck at, at accumulating a, a large number of, and this is crucial, relatively economically prosperous uh, early supporters who were taken by this 
American vision, which was also, I should say, radically uh, universalist in its uh, convictions because one of the things that had made Protestantism so dour over the years and had uh, sort of required, necessitated sort of, and had necessitated the Methodist break with predestination is that eventually you can't imagine anybody getting into heaven. And you essentially need a, a, a social jubilee to make up for the fact that it becomes harder and harder to live as a Christian as capitalism overdetermines our lives. And so not only did Smith have this vision of a godly America and of a godly American people, but also a promise of, of a loving God. Uh, according to uh, the visions of, of Joseph Smith in this time, uh, he, he was revealed the heaven. He was, he, was, he was shown heaven by God, and what he saw was essentially a eternal nightclub with different VIP sections. Uh, he was shown a heaven that was divided into three levels, the celestial, the terrestrial, and the telestial. Uh, and in them was the vast, vast majority of humanity. According to Smith's visions, only those who personally re uh, rebuke Christ to his face, basically, uh, are spared some measure of salvation in that there is an eternal life. Uh, but there are higher levels for better performers. <laughs> Those who uh, are able to spend their time on earth perfecting their character through their actions, perfect their character through their actions, uh, they would be able to ascend to a higher level with the, with the highest level being the, the celestial level for those persons who spent their time on earth perfecting their character per, to, the, to the highest degree. Uh, and this is, this is a universalist vision, but it also maintains a social engine. It doesn't tell you, hey, everybody's saved, relax. It, it says, uh, everybody's saved, relax. But now, wouldn't you rather be more? If God has given you this gift and you have nothing to fear, wouldn't you rather more? A greater understanding? The greater your degree of understanding and communion with God is the greater your, upon death, understanding of the universe. So it contains within it both the, the comfort of sort of a spirit, a social welfare state, uh, a, a safety net. Uh, it also gives room for personal, uh, the rewarding of personal refinement. And according to Smith's vision, the only way you could refine yourself is if you could live a life that was fully invested with religious belief, which means you had to escape the clutches of uh, capitalism as it was pincers, as it was squeezing the life out of Upper New, New York from both ends of the Erie Canal. So very early on, Smith's vision of the Mormon church is for it to be a new city on a hill, a, re a resuscitation of the Puritan idea of reconciling spiritual desire to live uh, in a godly way with the bountiful continent of America by seizing some of that available land due to uh, expropriation of natives and then remaking social relationships away from the market and towards community. And that is what Smith spent the rest of his life trying to do over and over again, building religious communities that then eventually collapsed from internal crisis and external pressure, causing the, the uh, movement to a new uh, outpost all the way until uh, the final reckoning at uh, Nauvoo uh, when, when Smith is killed by, uh, was killed by an anti-Mormon mob which really uh, ends the, the prophetic age of the uh, Mormon church, and which is where we'll end this episode. Spoiler alert. The first is Kirkland, Ohio, where Smith tries to organize a social mechanism, or, uh, so, so organize a body of believers into a corporate social form. So um, not only does he begin the creation of a church hierarchy, so this flies in the face of, uh, of most of the other evangelical preference for uh, horizontal authority within uh, the movement uh, and instead imposes a hierarchy. Uh, now, it is a ra lay religion. There is no formal priesthood within Mormonism. Every uh, adult male is ritually initiated into a priesthood that gives him certain uh, authority within the church, but only within a hierarchy of other, other authoritative authoritative bodies. 
Uh, there's the first presidency of the church, which was held by uh, Joseph Smith. There was the ha- uh, high council. There was the quorum of the 12, which is a pretty baller name. Uh, and there was the another larger group called the 70s. And all of these different groups were made up of different, more or less influential people within the Mormon community and whose job it was basically to maintain a uh, coordinated social effort. Uh, and when, one of the things they did with this uh, hierarchy uh, was to try to initiate something that Smith called the uh, United Order, uh, which was a church program to have land held by uh, people in the church, uh, owned by the church itself, and then the products of that land distributed to members of the church according to their need. Uh, and this was a doctrine of the early church that Smith uh, insisted on when the, his followers started moving to Ohio. Uh, and so he attempted to try, attempted to create this Christian communal so- social order in Kirkland. And this is very similar to the things that were happening with the Oneida organization, only, you know, more explicitly uh, tied to religious prophecy uh, rather than you know, secular morals. Uh, but there was a problem with this effort, which Smith tried again and again as he, as he uh, moved west, uh, because the richer members of the church were more reluctant to communalize their property than the poorer members. And so the people who signed up to do this tended to be those who needed more than they had. Uh, and that led to struggle. Uh, and it's part of, it was part of that process that was pulling these people apart from each other as it was bringing them together. Uh, but Smith made a very valiant effort to try to transcend uh, the market within the bonds of the church and to allow people to live uh, as free citizens with, I think, his eventual most apocalyptic vision, uh, imagining eventually all people coming under uh, this new social order because of its superiority, because it would win in competition with uh, the grubby emergent capitalism of the the now godless American uh, empire. So by the the mid-1830s, Smith is in Kirkland, Uh, He's also sending uh, people out into the Missouri Territory to look for new lands there because they're already getting static from local non-Mormons who are freaked out by this weird cult. And there's already a bunch of uh, uh, former Mormons who break away from the movement and then come back to denounce it because uh, there's a lot of people who come to Kirkland uh, who come because uh, of Smith's promise of access to personal prophecy. And so there are tons of prophets running around Kirkland. Uh, and there's also a lot of ecstatic religious behavior. There's speaking in tongues. There's rolling on the ground. There's uh, there's all kinds of ecstatic reveries, uh, and a lot of people claiming different things that to have been told by different things by God. Many things that contradicted what Smith was saying. Uh, and Smith had to battle against a lot of these early uh, competitors because he had really opened the door for that. Uh, and the thing that aided him was this social structure that he had built. This this hierarchy. Uh, uh, which people were invested in and, and which gave them a direction. Uh, and so when uh, rivals challenged Smith, Smith was able to affirm an orthodoxy that was uh, sustained by the majority of the church. And so a lot of people left in resentment, and some of them came back to denounce Mormonism. A lot of the most fervent anti-Mormons in Ohio and uh, Illinois and Missouri are, an- are former Mormons, but, it may- but the church maintains its cohesion. In 1837, Joseph Smith has an idea to charter a bank because he is looking to, you know, harness capitalism to this social vision, to this religious vision. Uh, and in so, and a bank is a way to do that. It allows you to circulate currency uh, and build capital, uh, especially in these quote unquote frontier conditions. Uh, the, the legislature uh, refuses his charter uh, and Smith does it anyway uh, and starts circulating hundreds of thousands of dollars in currency from this bank which he picked a bad year to do that because 1837 was the year when the uh, flow of credit from Europe slackened a little bit, causing a massive uh, currency crisis as all of that circulating currency from all of those banks uh, was called in and all of the bank vaults were found to be empty, including Smith's bank. So after the the fall of the the bank with uh, the local population turning against them, Smith moves uh, to Missouri, where there had already been an encampment of Mormons. Uh, but in Missouri, uh, 
there is an immediate ex- uh, escalation of conflict with the local uh, non-Mormons, and something that is later called the Missouri the, the Missouri Mormon War erupts, uh, and uh, this is an escalation of conflicts between local non-Mormon settlers and settlers and Mormon settlers uh, in Missouri. Uh, a lot of it over allegations of things like uh, polygamy, which by this point Joseph Smith and his uh, inner circle of Mormons were all a uh, big time into. Uh, but also there were questions of political power. Uh, Mormons were largely abolitionist in sentiment and Missouri was a slave state. There was questions of whether the Mormons were going to be uh, able to dominate local politics because of their numbers. And there was a question that they were trying to impose religious views on those around them because uh, what the Mormons are trying to do here, bind Americans to something higher than themselves in order to uh, maintain and protect like this spiritual dimension of their lives struck non-Mormons, the people who had more readily acceded to the, uh, my, the framework and, uh, and, and values of the early Republic, uh, found, uh, tyrannical, uh, and threatening the same way they did Roman Catholicism, uh, it, and Southern slavery. It was all a, a vision. It was a haunting vision of being socially coerced, but, because of, of sort of the, the wild possibilities of the, of the frontier, people really did conflate like the coercion of a slave to the coercion of someone who uh, operates out of a sincere religious conviction that informs their actions. And it was enough to cause uh, an escalation of tensions. Uh, the Mormons formed a militia that they called the Danites, which uh, carried out some violence against local uh, non-Mormons. A Mormon editor had his uh, printer smashed by a mob Loves mobs love smashing printers in the 19th century, by the way, one of the absolute favorite mob activities of the 19th century, like turning over a car after a uh, football game is to the 20th century. That was busting up uh, newspaper printers in the 19th century. Oh, also tarring, fe- tarring and feathering, which they did to the editor. Uh, and then th- this escalated to the point where the, where Smith himself was uh, jailed by the state of M- Mrs. Missouri uh, for uh, committing treason against it. Uh, well, a massacre of uh, Mormon settlers left 17 uh, women and children dead. Uh, and it, that combination finally made the Mormons get the hint. Uh, and they uh, moved in 19, 1839 to Nauvoo, not Nabu, no, there, there were no Gungans, Nauvoo, a small town in southern Illinois, which was originally called Commerce, hilariously enough. Uh, was chosen by the Mormons to become their new site of settlement. And they, uh, in 1839, uh, it was absolutely swamped with Mormons who essentially took it over uh, and renamed it Nauvoo, which means to the beautiful. Uh, And immediately Smith and the Mormons started about trying to build a uh, new city. They used the same design that they had in earlier attempts to build uh, towns, Big, wide, four-acre lots with straight streets enter a grid plan, basically, with lots of land uh, in the city uh, for agricultural production. Uh, the idea being that you would create a, a economic engine that was self-sustaining. The people would eat the land grown there, and then they would trade amongst themselves and with others, and they could grow prosperous. But it would be, at every level, an economy controlled by members of the religious community, by people within the communion, people who went to the newly built temple uh, and care, and went along with all of the myriad of social activities that the Mormons, uh, with all of these social engagements that Mormons uh, became uh, maniacally obsessed with. The theatrical groups, uh, dances, there were parties. Uh, there was no ban on or uh, contempt for secular entertainment because it wasn't really secular. Uh, Protest, most fervent Protestants in the rest of the country viewed things like dance and theater as decadent and, and sinful because they associated it with with out there. Uh, but for the Mormons who felt like in the bosom of a religious community, uh, they weren't threatening because they were all happening within uh, a family. And family became, for Smith, the main uh, structure he used to try to build this new durable social network that could withstand the buffets of capitalism. Uh, and he did that through plural marriage, polygamy, his most controversial revelation, one his wife was not happy with, and which many of the women of, uh, of early Mormonism were not happy with, but which in Smith's mind 
went towards solidifying social bonds with people, making real the abstract uh, connections between members of a community. Many of the wives that uh, Joseph Smith picked up, and he did, he was like Pokemon there for a while in the early 30s, catching them all. Many of them didn't leave their homes. Uh, he was, uh, he, they called it spiritual marriage. Uh, and what it, all it did really more than anything was confer a social obligation onto people that hadn't been there before. This is all part of Smith's family focused vision, a social vision, uh, turning the family uh, into a model that is then reproduced in the church itself and the society that the church creates the church and the people working together, growing crops together, trading together, Bill, all through this network of families. And family becomes the defining metaphor for uh, Mormonism, not the individual. Uh, and so another part of that is, and Smith has another prophecy, that, uh, that those who die, who died before uh, the church was formed, and those who die outside of its... Uh, vision can be baptized posthumously, which makes sense. Cause remember if there's no real hell for, for uh, Joseph Smith, everyone basically is saved to some degree or another, but a baptism posthumously could raise that soul to the higher level. Uh, and, and that sparks a mania for genealogy that defines Mormonism to this day and which serves as a reinforcement of these ideas of family as a transcendent uh, institution whose hierarchical structures are reproduced, who's benevolent, I should say, and that's the assumption behind all of this. And this is, of course, what is corroded over time and is now, you know, a parody of itself. But was the original vision uh, was a, a benign hierarchy of family that is reproduced throughout eternity. And that the afterlife is a continuation of those family bonds. Because one thing that, uh, that sets Mormonism apart than from all other religious traditions within Christianity at this point is its emphasis on human, the limitlessness of human potential in traditional Christianity. Humans are lesser than God in a meaningful sense. God is an eternal being. We can only eventually seek union with God. And like I said, like that is religion as an expression of that ineffable sense of connection with, uh, eternity that is pulled away from in our, that we are pulled away from every day in, in our lives by the demands of, of life, by the demands of sustaining ourselves, which by now, by the time of the Mormons means uh, engaging in this degraded market, in this degraded uh, a social life where you are meeting in your day, strangers who you're interacting with uh, through these cold, rela uh, cold commercial relationships. So of course for Smith, uh, our families are eternal. You stay with your family for eternity, but your old family, your ancestors will be there too. Everyone will be there in a great interlocking connection, but you will maintain your individuality. And that is why, where Mormonism really is the perfection of uh, American religion, because it imagines God not as an eternal being, but as a human being. Uh, towards the end of his life in Nauvoo, uh, Smith laid out a theory of God as a perfected essentially man and that all humans, all human men anyway, had the potential to be perfected eternally into their own God. This is a cosmology that could only exist in the context of North American settler colonialism. Th this vision of, of, of a limitless frontier of, of, of human potential and, and, uh, and domination more than anything. Uh, is not th thinkable in, in regions of the world where, uh, where human society is settled into a, a static relationship with itself. Uh, in North America, the, the asymmetry between the technological capacity of the settler colonists and the native population meant that an unprecedented mass of territory was up for grabs. An entire continent could be rewritten by people if they had the will to do it. And Smith's vision was to write that vision of eternal, pros, uh, eternal perfection into the world by dominating the continent. And then, of course, the stars and eternity, and eventually to become God over one's own universe.
And this is this is the spiritual resolution of the con- of the problem that the Puritans had, which is that they uh, they felt God as a alienated being, as an inscrutable, uh, wrathful mind, who is not whose intentions. Uh, and desires uh, could not be divined, and that is a terrible God. It's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a vengeful God. But a few hundred years later, with the creation of a of this machinery of westward expansion and this promise that is undergirding all of uh, every social class that there is uh, an opportunity uh, that there is access to livelihood and prosperity. In that context. God can be good, and more importantly, you can be God. That singular, that isolated perspective that you now are forced to live with, that is separate from God, that can become God literally. And our ability to cooperate in the settlement of the continent will let that happen. And for this moment, Smith has his flag planted uh, in Illinois in the town of the newly christened town of Nauvoo, where he was elected mayor in 1842. Now at this point, the Mormons have been hounded out of Ohio, hounded out of Missouri and are already having conflict with the local non-Mormons in Illinois. All of this is, is putting a toll on Smith's ability to hold this thing together. Uh, and in that environment, Smith begins a uh, massive recruitment drive to bring converts to the fold and then to, instead of having those converts stay at home, come to Illinois to live here in the new Zion. Uh, and the place where uh, this missionary work had its most profound uh, impact was Great Britain. So by 1838, there's 1,400 Mormons in Great Britain. By 1847, it's 16,000. A big reason for this is that the Industrial Revolution is ramping up in England, and and citizens uh, and people there are being thrust into these newly horrifying conditions of, of industrial labor. Uh, and it's among the populations of new urban workers in Manchester and Liverpool that the Mormons see their best recruiting done. Uh, not only are they, do these people hear a vision of religious community, that vision is one of communal uh, property. It's one of uh, cooperation. Uh, it's one of fresh air, access to food, uh, escape from the wage relationship, uh, and more than anything, a way to emigrate without fear of just falling through the cracks uh, as, as, a, as a relatively poor immigrant, which happened to a lot of people when they got to the United States. The existence of the Mormon community preclu- precluded that for the English emigrants. So while he's doing this, Smith is also trying to build up the, the church's national profile, and in early 1844, uh, he decides to run for president. So Smith had been arrested in Missouri. He was really being castigated in the national press. By now, there is a national awareness of what Mormonism is and a general repellent repulsion towards us. Uh, and Smith tries to get ahead of it by uh, getting a bunch of his supporters together to form a political party and uh, get him on the presidential ballot. Uh, uh, so the, the Mormons got together, formed a new party called the Reform Party, got a convention, and nominated Joseph Smith for the presidency. Uh, he, he won on the first ballot, if you can believe it. Uh, and his vision was to pitch to America the idea of a theo-democracy. Uh, and it would involve compensated emancipation for slavery. He w- wanted to create a national bank. Uh, he wanted to reduce the size of the House of Representatives. He wanted to abolish prisons, including debtors' prisons, and uh, opposed the annexation of Texas. Smith viewed this campaign as a way for him to get Mormonism out there, and he sent a bunch of campaign. He he spent a bunch of campaign operatives to eastern cities with the dual goal of pitching his presidential campaign, soliciting support at the ballot box, and also to recruit new Mormons. But before election day could happen, uh, trouble came to Nauvoo. So in early 1844, while he's getting ready to run for president. There's a dispute among some of the Mormons in Nauvoo, and uh, some of them uh, form a splinter group. Uh, they were mostly married, they said, because they, they claimed that Joseph Smith had proposed to their wives, and they weren't into it. Uh, so this splinter group of Mormon breaks away uh, from the, the church, uh, but begins to criticize it. And they put out an issue in June of uh, 
a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor, which calls for reform of the church and condemns Joseph Smith, calling him a would-be tyrant and theocrat uh, and a and a polygamist demon, uh, and that he was trying to use polygamy to seduce people's wives. Smith. Uh, as mayor of the town, got the city council together and banned the newspaper. And they went down and they smashed up that printing press. Uh, and that caused a local furor among the non-Mormons of the area who were already terrified of the uh, the the pretensions, the theodemocratic pretensions of Joseph Smith uh, and feared that he would try to make the, him, them like him. Uh, and this attack on free speech which of course is very funny because as I said, there's nothing any political mob of any persuasion in the 19th century loved doing more than destroying printing presses. But they used, this became the uh, pretense for uh, Smith to be uh, arrested by a local sheriff. And then while uh, him and his brother uh, were in the second floor of a, of a, of a sheriff's office, uh, a mob with blackened faces stormed the jail at Carthage where Joseph and his brother Hiram were being held uh, and both were shot Hiram in the face. Joseph Smith fell through the, th- the window. Uh, his last words were claimed to have been, Oh Lord, my God. But uh, they kept shooting him after he hit the ground. And that was also obviously the end of the uh, Joseph Smith presidential campaign. So here we have now this community of believers around this prophet who had organized their lives around his preachings, were now trying to live together in some approximation of community with these uh, new jerry-rigged political institutions uh, and this church hierarchy with its rituals and and, uh, duties that bound each member to to each other member uh, was left without their, their prophet, the one whose vision they all believed in and who could move the church one way or another uh, with his preference uh, and with his voice. Uh, He was the prophet. I mean, by by this point he is, he has gotten a monopoly on, on the, 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 on all of the major prophecies of uh, the Mormon community. And now he's gone. What next? Uh, How does this group reforge their beliefs uh, in a way that allows them to to keep together in in the face of the the serious resistance they face from without and also the contradictions that are uh, rife within it well tune in next time for part two of the mormons going west In 1838, Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs issued Missouri Executive Order 44, which said, quote, The Mormons must be treated as enemies and exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. Six years later, a mob in Illinois murdered Mormon prophet Joseph Smith. The Mormons were left a leaderless, despised community scattered in settlements across the Midwest. Now, they could easily have ended up as a footnote in 19th century religious history alongside countless other short-lived sects that tried to set their hand at living their understanding of Christianity before being ground down by the homogenizing force of American expansion. Instead, now, in 2010, there are well over 14 million Mormons worldwide, and those numbers include captains of industry and political leaders, cultural influencers, one of whom gained 48% of the popular vote in the 2012 presidential election. How did this amazing transformation happen? How did the Mormons go from a highly stigmatized sect on the American periphery to one of the most all-American of religious traditions? Well, they did it first by fleeing to the West to escape the persecution and assimilationist demands of the American state. And then when that state finally caught up with them by doing their best to perfect what America was trying to do, through the self-conscious creation of a religious, cultural, and political entity that could assimilate America's market forces on their own terms. 
So after Joseph Smith was killed, the Mormons were thrown into, obviously, uh, a shocked and horrified sense of confusion. Well, how would they go on? Uh, who, in fact, was in charge? Was this going to be a hereditary monarchy? Uh, uh, would the blood of, of uh, the prophet have to course in the veins of anyone who would claim leadership? Would people just go their separate ways? Would they assume that this was a sign that the church was wrong? Was this proof that the prophecy had failed? Was this a sign from God to find another uh, brand of Christianity? Before things could get out of hand, though, one man, Brigham Young, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, which was sort of the executive council of Mormonism at that time, seized the moment. Uh, Brigham Young was an uh, young, uh, early co convert to Mormonism and, like Joseph Smith, was uh, a religious seeker from the burned-over district of upstate New York. And from his position within, within the quorum, he, he affirmed the th authority of the quorum and was able to gain enough supporters in, uh, amongst the influential members of the church to assert a new course of action. The Mormons would get the fuck out of Dodge. The Mormons would no longer have to deal with neighbors uh, on their periphery in American states and territories uh, just begging for a chance to fucking kill them. Instead, they would head west to the Salt Lake Valley, which at that time was the northernmost point of the uh, Republic of Mexico. The Mormon uh, solution to uh, captivity in Egypt would be a flight as the Hebrews had had uh, into the wilderness. Brigham Young said at the time, quote, I am he who led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and my arm is stretched out to save my people Israel. The Mormons would save themselves, would uh, prevent their souls from being uh, pulled back into the matrix of antebellum American uh, market culture, which was in the process of tearing everybody from the land and all other verities and throwing them into a new, uh, a new modern world. And instead of allowing that to happen to them, the Mormons would find land where they could set their own country, essentially, to create a sovereignty where the prophet's words would serve as the basis for this civilization, where instead of just going where the money is, uh, as uh, people in America were doing, they would work together to create Zion on earth. And they self-consciously uh, modeled themselves on bi the biblical uh, Hebrews uh, and uh, whether consciously or on, sought to become the Jews of the American continent. Uh, this is around the time that Brigham Young starts referring to non-Mormons as Gentiles in a self-conscious mimicry of the relationship between uh, biblical Jews and, and non-believers. So, over 3,000 families comprising over 16,000 people who lived in the Mormon settlements in Missouri and Illinois and Ohio started selling all their property in order to buy supply, the supplies necessary to make a long westward journey. And the first wagon trains left Nauvoo, Illinois, on February 4th, 1846. And this trek west becomes a, the, a fundamental uh, element of Mormon self-mythology, uh, of, of their, their foundation myth. The, the creation of the Camp of Zion, uh, the the trek to the winter quarters in Nebraska, and the final settling uh, on the banks of the Salt Lake, of the Great Salt Lake, and this is this is in miniature the uh, story of the American westward expansion. Of course, because it's the Mormons, it's happening earlier than it was for most Americans, who once again were following the money. You'd had by this point very little westward expansion. Uh, of the of into America's territories at this time, uh, most Americans were still slugging it out in the uh, in the lands east of the Mississippi. Here you see the Mormons leave uh, setting out 
two years before or three years before the first large scale westward internal migration occurs to California with the gold rush. Once again, following the money, uh, the Mormons believed that they were following God. And so they carried out their own Oregon trail uh, before that became a defining American experience. But by the time the Mormons having faced numerous travails on the way, finally got to Salt Lake Valley uh, it had been ceded to the United States as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ending the Mexican-American War. So that means that the states that they had tried to fled were waiting for them, basically. Uh, and Young made accommodations with the federal authorities because the federal authorities at this point had a vested interest in seeing people fill these newly acquired areas. And so there was uh, some subsidy to, uh, from the U.S. to the Mormon mission. But of course, it was accepted reluctantly. There was a lot of friction. Uh, and But in 1850, the uh, Utah was turned into a U.S. territory as part, of the, as part of the Compromise of 1850. And Brigham Young was appointed the territorial governor. So Young sets about trying to establish a Zion in, uh, Zion in, the, in, the, in the salt flats. And he sends missionaries to... Uh, across the country and to Europe where they'd had success recruiting, uh, making a call to a gathering at Zion. Uh, the idea that all Mormons everywhere should make their way to Utah so that they could build a country uh, in the wilderness. Of course, there are plenty of natives there who the Mormons make uh, half-hearted attempts to convert. And remember, according to Mormon doctrine, the Native Americans were Lamanites, who uh, were the descendants of those who had uh, fought, who had fought amongst each other in the uh, narrative of the Book of Mormon. And it was Mormon policy to try to bring them back to righteousness. But obviously they were doing that while taking land, so it made things sort of awkward and their attempts never really made to much. But they did have a free freedom to w live their own way that they had never been able to really achieve in the United uh, when they'd been in the United States, in Ohio and Illinois and, and in Missouri, and where they had clashed against existing American structures of power. Uh, here they were able to build them from scratch. They laid out Salt Lake City in a perfectly rationalized grid pattern around a central temple mound. They sent settlers out to, uh, to claim land, Across the West, uh, they've settled most of the major uh, towns and cities of Utah, but they also settled cities as far away as Las Vegas, Nevada, and San Bernardino, California. And they even applied uh, planning to uh, the settling layout. Uh, Welsh immigrants who came to uh, Salt Lake were sent to the southwest corner, which had uh, iron ore deposits in which they were hoping to mine. Uh, Southern American converts came and were sent to the southeast of the state to grow cotton. That part of the Utah is still to this name, to this day, called Dixie. The Mormons pooled money to create a perpetual emigration fund to pay for people to be able to come to Utah and build a country. Uh, the, so the later, because people kept coming, the, the wagon trains kept coming, but the second and third wave of Mormon emigrants to Utah were generally the poorest uh, European migrants, people who from England, say, uh, who had come to the United States with not much and were only able to access a small amount of a subsidy. Uh, and they were told to not bother with expensive oxen when they were buying supplies, but to buy hand carts and walk the whole way, dragging the carts, which thousands of them amazingly did. And that the hand cart is to this day a, a powerful symbol of, uh, of Mormon uh, resiliency and, and commitment, that people literally drag their possessions behind them like draw, draft animals in order to build Zion in Utah. And this was a real project. Young and the Mormon leadership had a vision of a cooperative system of economy to reflect the uh, 
religious solidarity of the Mormons. They did not have to live as strangers the way that the Gentiles did, the way those who had fallen away from the word of God had to. They were all in the a brotherhood and sisterhood of believers, which means that they did not need the market. And so there was a concerted effort early on uh, in the first couple of uh, decades, especially of uh, the Mormon settlement of Utah, where there was the church attempted to create uh, organs of cooperative economy, uh, collectively owned manufactories, land, uh, an attempt to suppress exchange, to suppress the creation of the market. Uh, at one point, Utah. Uh, at one point, Brigham Young said, "I would rather see every building and fence laid in ashes than to see a trader come in here with his goods." And to that end, they built, uh, they made an attempt to create a collective autarkic government. They didn't want to have to import anything. They didn't want have to want to rely on having to export anything. They tried to create a fully self-sufficient internal economy uh, based around collective ownership. Uh, there was an attempt to enforce uh, what was known in the early days uh, of the settlements in Missouri and Illinois as consecration, where people who joined the church would give over all of their well their property to the church and collectively own it with other members of the church. It was never, they were never able to enforce it. And most members never, uh, never accepted it, but it was an option that was, uh, socially emphasized, but most families were always more willing to just pay the 10% tithe to the church that they were also, uh, that was also an option available to them. So that made it difficult but that didn't stop them from trying. Uh, in a small town, in one of the small settlements called Brigham City, they formed something called the Brigham City Cooperative Association, in which citizens would buy shares in order to collectively own things like uh, the general store, uh, all the livestock, uh, textile manufacturing, a dairy, schools. They had a thing called the, um, the Tramp Department that was to employ beggars. A number of other towns founded uh, local cooperative organizations called United Orders that tried to assert collective ownership and to set wages and to distribute food and shelter as equitably as possible. There was even one town, Orderville, that basic that completely abolished private property and had a barracks communism where people lived in dorms and ate in cafeterias. And these organs attempted to resist the mercantile trade that was taking root in the cities because remember they can't really keep out non-mormons so non-mormons are moving into utah as well and are starting to trade and that trade is lucrative uh and these attempts to create a cooperative economic order are always in competition with this growing mercantile uh network and they'll struggle with that until the 1870s when, after the uh, Transcontinental Railroad comes in, the capitalism fully takes over and there's no way to compete with it. And what happens to, the, to Mormon cooperative living is the same thing that happened to all of uh, 19th century's many attempts at planned communities and utopian projects, your Owenites. Your, your new harmonies, they eventually were unable to compete with capitalism because there could be no long-term coexistence between capitalism and cooperative forms of economy uh, unless you have like a serious state power behind it. Uh, and in here, in an internal situation where you have a national market being established at this moment, no internal resistance is going to be on even a medium time frame, viable. And so uh, by the 1870s, this strain of, uh, of utopian economics uh, in the Mormon settlements is eventually uh, replaced by the market. Now, of course, at the same time, Brigham Young is endorsing slavery uh, and promulgating a decree, once again, Mormon prophets, especially at the top of the... Uh, pyramid have the ability to claim prophetic powers that allow them to make 
ex cathedra proclamations that then have the force of doctrine, uh, which is one way that, which is one of a number of uh, places where Mormonism uh, is similar to the Catholic Church, uh, which makes sense because the Mormonism really is an attempt to fuse the social structures of Catholicism with the dy- dynamism of Protestantism. Uh, and it's the, abs- it's the destruction of one or the other that leads uh, Catholics in the cities to stagnate, but at the same time dooms Protestants to a alienating headlong rush away from one another into a brutal compet- com- competition that destroys all Christian brotherhood. But anyway, this is to say that Brigham Young said, hey, uh, by the way, I know there was some ambiguity early on. We had some uh, black guys and gals running around some of our camps saying that they had been, they'd been touched by prophecy as well. Uh, and yes, some of them might have been endorsed by Joseph Smith. But guess what? Uh, there is no, there, no bishophood can be bestowed on a black person. Sorry which is in its own way part of the Western process of establishing whites-only uh, social relationships. Uh, you see it in all the Western states, uh, certainly in the Pacific Northwest and, and in Utah as well. And This is just uh, a religiously inflected part of that general trend to preserve uh, the Western frontier from, the com- more than anything, the competition of slave labor. So in these early days, while Young and his cadre are trying to impose this new religious orthodoxy and uh, social relationship onto their people and, and, and struggle against the elements and, and scrape together the money to ma- maintain viability, they're also having to do this as U.S. territories, which is an awkward tension, which is an awkward situation. Because they're trying to build a social structure outside of the American market with a theocratic social structure uh, and a collectivist economic order with, by the way, polygamy and a interpretations of the gospel radically alienating to every mainstream Protestant in the country. Uh, in the early in, in this antebellum era, uh, West, Eastern reformers uh, had three great, Social horrors. The, the, the northern bourgeois were terrified of three things. The slave power, the Antichrist in Rome and his army of brainwashed papists, and Mormonism, which felt like sort of an Americanized Catholicism and was rendered even more alienating by the presence of polygamy. Here were people who were not taking orders from their own hearts, but people who were obeying a uh, Religious hierarchy, just like all of those slum-bound Irishmen list, cocking their heads to hear the Muzine call from St. Peter's. So there's a, uh, there is a revulsion to Mormonism. There's an attempt by the federal government to, to impose more federal authority on Utah, which leads to conflict between the church hierarchy and, for example, uh, territorial judges who are appointed and sent in by the government. Uh, and out of this, there is a decision by the Buchanan administration coming in just as the sectional crisis is reaching its boiling point and wanting more than anything to make people forget about it and change the subject, decided that he was going to take Mormonism, this thing which was repulsive to all good Americans, north or south of the Mason-Dixon, and rent, make it the, the monster that needed to be slain. Uh, that's one conservative attempt to miss to redirect anti-slavery politics, because remember I said there's three things that the northern voter broadly defined uh, was horrified by. Well, the slave power could not be confronted by conservatives of both the Democratic and Whig parties, but Mormonism sure could. Now, the other one, papism, Buchanan as a Democrat could not uh, attack because. Too many Democratic votes depended on those urban machines made up of Catholics. It was up to the uh, silver-gray Whigs under Millard Fillmore to make papists 
uh, the villain to distract the northern populace from the slave power. And that's how you get the uh, rise of the know-nothings. But with Buchanan in and demonizing Catholicism out of the window as an option, there was this idea to pick a fight with the Mormons. And so as soon as he comes into office, Buchanan says that they're going to replace Brigham Young as territorial governor with a non-Mormon. And this was not possible. Uh, they, the Mormons at this point uh, are feeling themselves. They had shot it out with mobs in Missouri and Illinois. They had uh, runoff Indian attacks on their way out west. They had uh, dealt with assassination attempts against their leadership and, and fought off uh, bandits and rustlers on the frontier. They weren't about to give up their dream of creating their own uh, Zion in the wilderness. And so when Buchanan appoints a non-Mormon as governor of Utah and tells him to go and take office, Young refuses. And so Buchanan sends in troops uh, and, and threatens to install him into office as governor. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, the, the troops are taken over by uh, later one of the Confederacy's most able commanders, Alfred Sidney Johnston. And it is in this context with U.S. troops making their way to Utah that the most infamous scandal in Mormon history occurs, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And the Mountain Meadows Massacre was the systematic uh, cold-blooded execution of at least 120 members of an emigrant wagon train going through southern southwestern Utah, the Baker Fancher wagon train. Now, at this point, the Mormons in Utah are in a paranoid frenzy and terrified about what's going to happen and that they're going to be invaded at any moment. So there are a number of uh, bloody conflicts between settlers, non-Mormon settlers in Utah and non-Mormon settlers moving through Utah that lead to deaths uh, and, and violence and escalates the sense of anxiety. And it's in here, in this context, when this wagon train uh, is decided by some local Mormons to be a spy uh, for the federal government. And, and so uh, a bunch of Mormons come together under the uh, leadership of a guy named John D. Lee, uh, and dr some of them dressed like uh, Indians interdict this wagon train. And after besieging it for five days, making a false offer of truce to the uh, pioneers and then systematically massacring them. Uh, the only people who were spared were children under the age of seven who, who it was thought wouldn't be able to tell anybody. Uh, and at the time there were, there was no one even uh, arrested. Later in the 1870s, Lee would be uh, arrested, convicted, and executed. According to Mormon history, official Mormon history, it was all a terrible misunderstanding. There was a let breakdown of communication, and so people panicked and acted on their own volition. But John Lee and others assert that uh, high up members of the Church of Latter of the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints, up to and including Brigham Young, had awareness and possibly ordered it. Uh, it's never been established fully one way or the other, but it's certainly a black mark on the Mormon record. That's for sure. So the U.S. troops on the border just sort of sit there, and there is this prolonged standoff. Brigham Young declares martial law. Some Mormons from the Nauvoo Legion, which is a Danite militia raid a wagon train from the U.S. Army and burn 52 wagons. But the Army does not invade. And eventually mediation occurs, but no deal can be made. Eventually, in March of 1858, Brigham Young evacuates Salt Lake City and hides uh, from the advancing U.S. troops. Buchanan proclaims Utah in rebellion. Uh, there is a military invasion of Utah, uh, and eventually Cummings is installed as governor, and a military, a permanent military fort, Fort Camp Floyd, is established in Utah, about 50 miles from Salt Lake City. And 
eventually, without options really, Young accedes to Cummings' installation and steps down as governor. The entire thing ends up being kind of a debacle for Buchanan, though. People start calling it Buchanan's blunder uh, because it never turns into the uh, dramatic confrontation uh, and domination that Buchanan was probably looking for. But it did uh, get rid of Mormon uh, domination in Utah politically. That was the end of the dream of a Mormon theocracy. Between Young's replacement by an appointee of the state and later after the Civil War, the establishment of the Transcontinental Railroad, the political and the economic sources of Mormon power would be eradicated. Uh, But thanks in part to something that Brigham Young was doing while this confrontation with the United States was happening, the religious leg of the stool, the religious solidarity would be much deeper because it's during the confrontation with Buchanan and the, and what became known later as the Utah war, Brigham Young is, and his cadres are carrying out something that would later be called the Mormon reformation, which is a program of spiritual revival uh, that goes throughout the Utah territories in which young and the quorum go around and in a speaking circuit impelling their followers to renew their commitment to a spiritual life. And this leads to a huge increase in the building of meeting houses, uh, more active congregations. And it also affirms the structure of church governance that had been put in by young and the quorum once the Utah settlement had been established. And this is a system of what is called what are known as stakes, which are territories that are uh, controlled by a, a bishop. Now, of course, everybody here is a lay person. There is no formal clergy. There are appointed laymen, and these appointed laymen uh, are, are organized hierarchically throughout these stakes. And during the Mormon Reformation, those stakes are strengthened. And the amount of time that people spend at their church, on church business, building church uh, solidarity increases significantly. And that sense of being besieged by the, by the Gentiles certainly intensifies it. So, well, this is the period when Mormon uh, aspirations to sovereignty are uh, eradicated. The Mormon, Mormon church is solidified so that, well, yes, the Mormons were now at the mercy of Uncle Sam and would have to become subject to the market relationships of American political economy, they would be able to do so on their own terms. They would be able to do so as self-conscious members of a church whose social structure was such that it reinforced bonds instead of tore them apart. And that those reinforced social bonds could assimilate the American market and assimilate American politics towards the end of the community. But there's one big thing standing in the way of the church and this end, and that was polygamy. Now, polygamy had been crucial toward to the early church in that it provided a uh, matrimonial welfare state whereby single women could be brought under an umbrella of familial obligation. Uh, this is a, a proto-welfare state we're talking about. And that was very important in keeping the Mormon church together in those early awful years of privation and persecution. And also in the sense Mormonism now, since it could no longer take power in America realistically, would have to assert itself through the strength of its social bonds, needed to define itself against an outside force. And er, there were, and, and the early church father's opinion was that the fact, that the alienating effect of polygamy, the thing that made it repellent to non-Mormons, was a feature and not a bug. It drew the bright line between Mormons and non-Mormons, and that had crucial usefulness. But as the U.S. state increases its authority in the post-war years, as the Yankee Leviathan that that it was awoken by the Civil War comes into its own as a regulatory force, the presence of this alien social custom in Victorian America became untenable uh, for 
the non-Mormons, for the Gentiles, for, for Caesar in Rome. Now, Mormons by the 1870s and 80s, uh, about 20 to 30% of families were practicing polygamy, which obviously that's not a majority even, but it is a significant chunk. And most importantly, as a male church member, the more likely you were to practice polygamy was the more likely you were to have a high level of a higher rank within the church hierarchy. And the higher up in the church hierarchy you were, the more wives you tended to have. And so polygamy was disproportionately gathered around power socially. So it was very deeply embedded by the moment that it really comes into confrontation with the American state. And that happens. And the real starting gun for this conflict is the Supreme Court decision of 1878, Reynolds versus U.S., that declares that there is no protection, <clears throat> that there is no First Amendment protection for bigamy. You, you cannot claim religious exemption to bigamy laws. And by 1882, Congress passed something called the Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act, which explicitly outlawed polygamy uh, and empowered the government to root it out which was just a bullseye put onto Utah by a bunch of Victorian blue bloods in Washington who were scandalized by the very concept because polygamy in the post-war era was one of those boogeymen, which had not really been slain by the civil war. Only the slave power had, but Mormonism and, and bigamy were still there along with the, with the papists, of course, but now joined by free blacks as another, as another nightmare other. So the Victorians were horrified by polygamy, but according to the Mormons, polygamy was vastly morally superior to the nuclear family emerging in Victorian America as the ideal because polygamy had that social welfare feature built into it that ensured women against the horrors of uh, the market, basically. Uh, according to the, the Mormons of this time, the Victorian family, which was supposed to be the uh, acme of civilization and uh, morality was the thing that created brothels and orphanages and that polygamy prevented those social evils from accumulating by preventing women from falling through the cracks. And this is, a, I think, uh, a good example of that keen social uh, awareness of those early Mormons that what they were running from really was the market that they had not, they could not, they had not accepted yet the uh, ideological blinders of American mainline Protestants who saw what happened because of people's individual failings as fate, as God's will, basically. But for the Mormons, the fact that you had women selling themselves on the street and children scrounging uh, in the gutters was proof that uh, a system that left people outside of it, if they were not able to adhere, it, were not able to gain a perfect match one-on-one -on -one, was immoral. And this reflected, this was reflected in the theology of the church, which saw heaven as a network of families, stacks and stacks of families, all hierarchically arranged. That's one of the reasons that they, Love baptizing dead people is to increase one's family network in heaven because the greater the network you have, the, the farther you can see, the more, the more you're able to fulfill your godly potential. Uh, you can see why in the 20th, 21st century, Mormons are going to take two MLMs so easily. And so none of this is persuasive to the, the American government, of course, which starts sending marshals in to enforce bigamy laws and something that is known in Utah is the raid a period of years when over a thousand Mormon men were tried and convicted of bigamy uh, thousands more fled some to Mexico and it is a polygamist sect that fled to Mexico during the raid where George and Mitt Romney's family uh, came from now and and thousands more Mormons either renounced polygamy or publicly renounced it while privately continuing it. And this repression continued until an 1893 amnesty in which the, the Mormon church vowed to obey the Ed, Edmonds Act in exchange for an amnesty 
uh, of anyone who is still being sought. And it's this decision that uh, helps lead to Utah's acceptance in 1896 as a state and really allows fully for Mormons to try to uh, become Americans in their own terms. Now, the renunciation of polygamy, it should said, is not taken well by everyone. Uh, a large number of Mormons say that uh, the acceptance of Uncle Sam is not worth betraying their beliefs, even if uh, the prophet once again is able to say, hey, I had another revelation that said no more polygamy. And there were, this is when you see the creation of sects that would later become things like the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints uh, and create creepy polygamist compounds. I saw, I saw, I drove through Colorado City one time. Uh, everyone looked like children of the fucking corn. It was terrifying. All the houses were just gigantic uh, on small lots, but huge houses, all of them with plywood covered extensions that hadn't even been finished yet. You could tell that those houses basically never stopped getting built. Uh, but so these, that's, this is when you see fundamentalist uh, Mormonism emerge, which is people who will not accept the rendering of Caesar, uh, their religious right to practice polygamy. But the mainstream church gives up polygamy and is brought into the U.S. And this, coincidentally, is the exact same moment that the frontier closes for American expansion. And so this is the moment where uh, America comes into its own as a fully defined being, and uh, Mormonism does too. This is the end of the frontier era of America and of the Mormon church in the beginning of the progressive era. Now, uh, early on in the Utah days, the Mormons basically focused on, obviously, the work of creating their theodemocracy. But the non-Mormon settlers had their own political agenda, and eventually they formed uh, the Liberal Party, which is an umbrella party for the non-Mormons of Utah. And the Mormons answered that by uh, founding the People's Party, uh, which dissolved in 1881. And after that, just as the statehood is uh, being promulgated, you see uh, the membership start to uh, settle along partisan lines, according to American politics, with rank-and-file Democrats, like most small farmers and mechanics of the West, voting Democrat, and the elite of the party, uh, like the elites everywhere in America, voting Republican, largely because they uh, were being schmoozed by D.C. Republicans looking to maintain uh, influence in Utah. And so this means that eventually you're going to have a Mormon in Congress. And that happens in, 18, or in 1903 when Reed Smoot, that's right, Reed Smoot, is elected as a Republican to the Senate by the, legis the state legislature of Utah. And so Reed Smoot will be the first Mormon in the Senate. And this, because sh so short out, so shortly after the uh, Edmonds Act and the raids, scandalizes official Washington. And many members of Congress demand that Reed not be allowed to take his seat because Mormonism was in conflict with the principles of American democracy. The fear was is that, like a Catholic from the Pope, Smoot would take orders not from his conscience, as an American should, or the will of the people, but from the demands of the president of the church. And also, there was a assumption widespread that he was a fucking polygamist. Now, Smoot never was a polygamist, but come on. That was what Mormons were known for. This led to a series of hearings about Mormonism and about Reed Smoot's relationship to Mormonism that lasted from 1904 to until, until 1907. And it was a deliberation over whether Smoot would be allowed to take his seat. And this was new progressive Mormonism's coming out party for America. Moderate Mormons like Smoot got to make a case to the American people for their normalization, that they, they learned their lesson and that they were normal. They loved democracy. They loved America, uh, that they were on board. And of course, this is what you do to survive, obviously. Uh, and it worked. 
Uh, there was never any evidence produced that Smoot was a, poly- uh, was a polygamist. He answered questions about his uh, allegiances eloquently, and he eventually wins over the, uh, the center of gravity of American public opinion and the, and, and the Senate. One of his allies in the Senate who uh, endorsed his ascension to the seat in reference to all of the obvious philanderers in the Senate uh, said, as for me, I would rather have seated beside me in this chamber a polygamist who doesn't polyg than a monogamist who doesn't monog. Boom, roasted. And around this exact same time, a new modernized and complete Mormon theology is being promulgated that uh, channels the progressive moment and reflects America's greater aspirations. So James Talmadge, a mining consultant, uh, during this period in the early aughts, is going around with a series of lectures uh, about Mormon theology and about the basis for Mormon belief and what sets it apart. Uh, And during the aughts and teens, he, along with a few other theological laymen, lay out in a number of books and pamphlets a fully synthesized, modernized Mormon theology, which is the church that exists now. This is really the the creation of modern, uh, post-polygamy, post-prophetic, post-charismatic Mormon history. And in these descriptions, Talmadge explains that, for example, with polygamy, so polygamy is based on this notion of celestial marriage, a marriage that is transcends time and space. And Talmadge argues that just means that the marriage is eternal. It doesn't mean it necessarily has to be plural. So it's, it's normalizing Mormonism uh, for, for a mass audience. And the theology uh, that Talmadge and others promulgate is free real estate, the religion. It is America condensed into a transcendent, theology. Uh, it truly is a uh, Christian Scientology uh, at a point of human history when, when faith and revealed religion still had mass persuasive power is a er- period that's dying. And in that last gasps, modern Mormonism is forged, which is essentially uh, an ideology of relentless and monomaniacal optimism. It is the American positivity compulsion turned into a story of creation. Uh, It is a religion without original sin in which all mankind will be saved because mankind is universally good and universally capable of achieving godhood. Forget capable of salvation. Salvation is a minimum. Everyone's getting saved. That's taken for granted. But humans have the capability, all of them, uh, through the application of will to pursuing virtue and self-improvement, literally take on the character of God. This is a religion that is able to cross that chasm between the eternal and the individual human, not by imagining uh, a bridge of salvation, but of denying that there is any distinction between the two. It is in that way, fully materialized. Heaven is not a transcendent reunion with a force beyond our understanding. It is the perpetuation of our individual consciousness eternally as we apply principles and self-improvement to the process of literally building a universe. There is a term that Talmud uses that becomes one of the key phrases of Mormon theology, eternal progression. God didn't even make the universe out of nothing. He shaped it out of existent matter through his own will, as will all people who pursue a eternally progressive spiritual life, as in go to church, participate in church life, reflect on that life, and in so doing, bring yourself in accordance with, with the God within you that is already there. Sin is not, uh, in this context, original or, or an indelible stain. It is essentially just the consequence of failing to, live, failing to live up to your godly potential. And that's why God will never send anyone to hell, because he's mostly just disappointed. You could do so much better. If you're willing to accept 
mere salvation, okay, I guess, fine, but there are literally universes awaiting you if you are willing to try harder and aspire to more. It is a radically individualized theology. It, it is American individualism uh, sacralized, but and this is the most important part. It is nestled in a framework of deep social reinforcement. If you have an entire church full of people who believe this way, then they and they participate in a church life that is as rigorous and as all-consuming as the structures of Mormonism. Being a member of a stake is a responsibility that puts things upon you and that spent, it makes that leads you to spend your time with the church as opposed to making money with a little bit of time for the church like everybody else in America. And making money becomes part of your life of the church because now that you have to have capitalism, you can at the very least use your social network to make connections, to network in such a way to use capitalism towards your own collective social ends rather than the individual ends. And so even though everybody is looking towards turning themselves into God, since they're all doing it at the same time in the same way, by participating in the same social life, they're actually able to maintain that belief as opposed to everywhere outside of the, of the church where people are radically individualized, but in a desaturated spiritual environment where they don't spend that much time in church. They don't spend that much time with believers. They spend time among strangers, alienating themselves from each other and therefore being tossed by the seas of the market because all they can pursue is their own self-interest alone as opposed to those within the church who are now able to pursue their own self-interest together because their self-interest is wedded to the church. Whereas outside the church, self-interest is wedded only to the self. It's at the same period that formal church behavioral doctrines, things to set Mormons apart from everyone else in America are reestablished. Now, Polygamy's out. That's the bridge too far. But how about no hot drinks or alcohol? How about no caffeine? How about that? That's kind of weird, but it's not weird enough for the fucking marshals to show up or for somebody to get a posse and burn down your church. This is when the word of wisdom is promulgated, which goes from, which takes some of the doctrines that un, during the Smith days the Smith and Young period had been mostly suggestions of best practices and turned them into formal church commandments, no hot drinks or alcohol, which replaces polygamy as the behavioral line between you and everybody else. It is a refusal to participate uh, in a social ritual that allows you to maintain your solidarity. Now, of course, there's plenty of Mormons who drink and have hot drinks, they're large. They're known as Jack Mormons, and there's tons of them out west. Uh, they're Mormons who might, who have never been excommunicated from the church, and, and are still part of the social life of the church, but who don't really obey any of that uh, stuff. But once again, that liminal state is implied by any harsh demarcation. That's going to happen no matter what, and that's how it manifests uh, for the Mormons. Uh, so, how do you go about being a good person? Well. The good news is that the two big principles of Mormonism are that the universe is comprehensible and that people can act on their comprehension of the universe. And that is a reflection of the progressive moment that America was living through when uh, empirical observation, rational scientific management was taken to be the solution to uh, mankind's mounting crises. And faith in human progress became enshrined in America's civic religion and of course, also becomes enshrined uh, in Mormonism, which is being reformed at this moment. That means that there is no division between science and religion, that any perceived misalignment between faith and scientific understanding of the universe is just a misunderstanding that will, within time, be unfolded. Because there is no contradiction between science and religion, because we are all tasked with 
pursuing our self-improvement through rational observation of the world around us. So at this, by this, at this point, Utah is politically, now that it's been welcomed into the American partisan political structure, the political system, basically flows with the wind. Uh, they vote for Roosevelt. They vote for Wilson. They vote for the Republicans in the 20s. And then when the Great Depression happens, they vote for FDR and Truman. Uh, and in Utah during the Depression, a number of Mormons resurrect some of those mutual aid concepts from the days of, uh, since the days of consecration, uh, and start doing collective enterprises again, and uh, use the church structure of stakes and bishops to distribute relief. But the Mormon leadership becomes deeply alienated from the New Deal. For unsurprising reasons, they're now at the top of a uh, thriving capitalism inside Utah being carried out by Mormons, but with this new religious understanding undergirding it that allows them to participate in the market without feeling that their soul is being pulled out of their body because they have this social network to conduct capitalism within. They're not doing capitalism in the sh harsh stark marketplace, they're doing it in the bosom of the church. And they're doing very well. If the leadership of the of the church itself tends to be made up of very successful businessmen. And so their hostility to the New Deal is uh, pretty easy to understand. But it isn't until uh, after World War II, and specifically once the culture wars kick in the 60s, that Utah really becomes a reliably de Republican state. Because they find themselves on the other end of pretty much all of the big uh, revolutionary cultural conflicts that emerge because their uh, their identity is so tied up in a revealed Christian inspired religion, and so by and after World War II, uh, the church enters as America does its Fordist era, when uh, the church goes about a process of standardizing uh, and simplifying simplifying its administration, its doctrine its curriculum for its missionaries in a process called correlation uh, that mirrors the organization of the U S economy around corporations that happens at the same period. It's a rationalization of the management of the church that leads to uh, the leadership of a guy named David McKay, who's the president of the, the church, of Latter-day Saints from 1951 to 1970 and is essentially the CEO of Mormonism. Uh, he is the CEO of Mormonism, Inc. He increases missionary uh, outreach to Americas with a new message. The, the church is wherever you are. They've given up the dream of Zion and an independent uh, sovereignty in Utah. And since now we're in a global capitalist market after World War II, it doesn't matter where people live. They can, they can participate in the church anywhere as long as you can set up the structures of the church for them to live within. And McKay presides over this process of the rationalization of the church, which means extinguishing the, the, the last embers of the, uh, the charismatic prophetic tradition within Mormonism, which today largely resides uh, in the splinters the, the, the movements that have fallen off of mainstream Mormonism, uh, and which has accelerated as economic conditions have declined, of course. So McKay takes, turns the church into a smooth functioning machine with missionaries going around the world and helping set up uh, new stakes in new countries with a thriving Mormon media, Mormon uh, outreach programs, they create a nested series of organizations and committees and universities and nonprofit groups, all were and corporations, of course, businesses started and run by Mormons, all working together, all moving, all churning to direct tithes to a church structure that then increases the efficacy of the machine itself. So during these years, the church has turned into a finely tuned machine. Under McKay, 
There's a massive growth in the church. There were 400,000 Mormons around the turn of the, 19, turn of the 20th century. When McKay took power in 1951, there were 1.1 million. When he died in 1970, there were 2.8 million. In 1960, the first stake outside the United States was established in, appropriately enough, Manchester, where so many of those early British Mormon converts had been recruited. This is when McKay says, Zion could be anywhere. And this is during the time, this is the time when Mormonism really gets integrated into uh, the, the fabric of America. Mormons start thriving in business and in government. Uh, George Romney, a descendant of the Mormons who fled to Mexico so they could keep being polygamist, became a chairman of GM and then governor of Michigan and a top ranked presidential candidate in 1968 before he blew his candidacy by claiming that he had been brainwashed by generals about Vietnam. Uh, but his church affiliations basically never came up in the campaign. And so, fittingly enough, a lot of the uh, energy that would have gone in a previous generation into, in for, in, into insisting on some sort of doctrinal orthodoxy within the church gets directed into politics and into the vein of reactionary politics that is erupting at this same period. Because having been fully, accumul fully assimilated to capitalism and having subordinated capitalism to the project of the church, Mormons found themselves more and more amenable broadly to the politics of the Republican Party and to reactionary politics in general. Now, of course, there's plenty of Mormons who don't agree with that, but since so many Mormons are successful in business during this period, it makes sense that more of them are likely to accept the reactionary framework of the post-war crisis. And a couple of figures who help shape Mormonism's response to the social breakdown of the 60s and 70s are Ezra Taft Benson and W. Cleon Skousen, a couple of great names. Ezra Taft Benson was agriculture secretary under Dwight Eisenhower, and then he spent the 60s shaping Mormon politics around strident culture war and rabid hostility to government interference in the economy. Now, this is going to be the same combination of views that will dominate evangelical religious revival in the 70s and 80s, but Benson was a visionary of it in the 50s and 60s. It is a moralistic libertarianism that was the dominant right strain until very recently, and it has held on to the Mormons more strongly than elsewhere uh, and, took on, uh, and took hold earlier basically because that combination of beliefs is at least theoretically possible under Mormonism where church identity can plausibly withstand the alienating and the stabilizing forces of the market. So Benson becomes a uh, public and strident anti-communist, a person who, uh, who sees civil rights and any kind of worker power basically as tantamount to communism. Uh, he eventually became church president in 1973. Uh, and he, held off the religious shit or he held off the political stuff once he became church president. And he focused himself more on flooding the earth with books of Mormon and making sure that the book of Mormon was distributed as widely as possible across the world. And the other guy, uh, W Cleon Skousen, he was a John Birch society fellow traveler who helped articulate the specific American populist libertarian nightmare cosmology that eventually got picked up by guys like Ron Paul and uh, Glenn Beck and is now the real deep political theology of QAnon, I would argue. And it's the idea that there is an unholy alliance between uh, finance capital and communism to destroy individual human liberty. Uh, he wrote a book called The Naked Communist about the, the real goals of communism he wrote a book called The Naked Capitalist about how the Western merchant bankers had stood up communism in order to destroy individual liberty. He saw the Constitution as divinely inspired and therefore any attempt to uh, alter it as demonic. So this is uh, the theology of the modern right, where there is a native God-inspired capitalism, a, a, a free market, literally, where God's will reigns. 
And then there is a, a cabal, a, a secret group, Jews usually, who have used the machines of free government necessary to allow the market to reveal God's will to def- deform it and def- and to twist it away from freedom and that its tools are capitalism uh, and also the collectivizing spirit of communism and that the long-term goal is collectivization and that capitalism is antithetical to this process, which means that the finance capital that a Marxist might associate with capitalism is to uh, the Skousenite, and I think now uh, the right in general, that is not capitalism. That is Marxism, which is Judaism, which is the other, coming to smother uh, democracy, uh, Christ-inspired democracy. And when I say Skousen is one of the, pro- the real progenitors of this, I'm not saying that he's the reason people believe this, just that he is articulating the only real response possible by someone who believes America is in any way godly. And that goes for Mormons and it goes for evangelicals. It goes for allegedly materialist libertarians. They all have elevated America to uh, a transcendent realm. And in so doing, they have inoculated themselves against any material critique of politics. So even though capitalism eats away at all social bonds, which is something that the early Mormons were very, very clear on and saw with their own eyes and tried to prevent, uh, by this point, Americans, even the Mormons, have largely forgotten how to see it because for them, the values of capitalism are by, are the mechanisms by which God's will in the world is revealed. And so collectivist remedies to capitalism can only deny what God wants and impose what the devil wants, basically. It might never be thought of in these terms, but that is, that's the cosmology of American folk capitalism. And Skousen represented it. He also did help influence it because, for example, Glenn Beck's entire 912 project was inspired by Skousen's writings. And I think if you look especially at QAnon, their understanding of how capitalism works, how American politics work, who the villains and enemies are in the political economic menagerie, uh, it's all Skousen. Now, at this point, as I said, Mormonism is really being normalized into the mainstream of American culture. But once again, as time passes, uh, new areas of contradiction emerge. And by the 70s, the new polygamy for Mormons was the fact that they explicitly denied membership to black uh, people, which means, among other things, that they denied mem- uh, they de facto denied the attendance of black people to their universities like BYU. And in a post-civil rights era America, where formal regimes of segregation were becoming socially unacceptable, that too had to go. And so voila, there's another miraculous revelation that just so happens to accommodate Mormonism to the center of American politics and culture again. What a fucking coincidence. So Mormonism continues to grow. It grows internationally, and now uh, it's able to grow uh, in places like Africa, uh, and it grows in Asia, and it's and the growth is powered by missionaries, which is every young man uh, in the Mormon church expected to perform two years of missionary work when they graduate high school, and you might have seen them in their starched white shirts and their ties holding the Book of Mormon. You might have seen the Book of Mormon. Even if this missionary work doesn't have the impact of actually converting people. It does have the impact of confirming young members of the church in their church hierarchies. It's part of a process of rising through ranks of priesthood that was established in the Utah days. And that has a very powerful influence in keeping members within the flock. And that means, and the, and the fruits of that are that 
You know, there are 14 mi- in 2010, there were 14 million members of the LDS church, a little less than half of them in the United States. There are 100,000 Mormons in Nigeria, 125,000 in Japan, half a million in the Philippines. There's even a guy in England who claims that he's got a Book of Mormon that says that all of that shit happened in England, actually, which just flagrant copying from the from that blighted aisle. And it's a church where membership is reinforced through behavior. Uh, on a typical Sunday, a Mormon has three hours of ward meetings. They have a sacramental service with uh, sermons and hymns. There is a Lord's Supper. There's Sunday school for the kids, priesthood, quorums. The Relief Society, which is the woman's auxiliary, meets uh, one night a week for young for teenagers. There's young men's and women's activities. The ward officials have something like 20 hours a week of duties in addition to their their full-time other jobs because, again, there is no paid separate clergy within Mormonism. It is a fully lay, lay church. It's able to sustain its powerful level of hierarchy because of its uh, deep social grooves. And that leaves us in the church's most recent phase, which once again reflects America's phase. Like America, Mormonism is in its MLM era, multi-level marketing. The end of the yellow brick road of financialization of the economy, when pyramid schemes are the only roads of infinite growth, the thing that structured all of the dreams of free real estate and its attendant political and theological fantasies was based on. And while MLMs have sprouted up all over the country and are popular with many people, they are especially popular and especially successful in Utah. In Utah County alone, there are at least 15 major multi-level marketing companies that generate billions in revenue. It's the second biggest industry in Utah behind tourism. And as with everything else, Mormonism's ability to anticipate turns in American politics and the economy because of their self-compact social structure and ability to coordinate action through their hierarchy means that they're able to use that moment better than the rest of us. So while millions of people across the country try and fail to make money at MLMs, plenty of Mormons succeed. Of course, not all. There's plenty of Mormons who have been absolutely screwed by MLMs, and there's plenty of poverty and downward mobility in Utah in general. But compare them to, say, America's white evangelicals, who they are largely from the same social basis of. It's not a contest. And one of the big reasons for that is that the MLM structure of marketing to social networks actually works for Mormons because they have a social network. Americans take on the the task of finding down lines and recruiting people into MLMs, but nobody knows anybody in this fucking country. Nobody has any friends. People have small families with, with relatively shallow family ties. Thanks to all of that social interaction and those big families at this point, even without the polygamy, Mormons have a demographic engine in the form of their relentless desire to be fruitful and multiply. So you've got, Big families who know big families, who are all parts of stakes together, who spend hours and hours a week together, which l- creates a dynamic where, where, where a multi-level marketer can find a network of downlines to work from much more easily than non-Mormons in this country, which is just the latest iteration of Mormonism being able to adapt to capitalism on its own terms. But of course... Like consecration and the United Orders, they will eventually be ground down and their social solidarity will be that further much reduced. But they will have held out as a self-conscious social entity capable of real belonging uh, much longer than the rest of us. And all because one starry-eyed water dowser in upstate New York had a vision that told him that American Christianity would drag everyone to hell and 
The Mormons have been outrunning hell ever since. And we'll see, I guess, all of us, how much longer they can make it. Goodbye. Goodbye.